Welcome to r slash malicious compliance, where a stupid car salesman loses a $45,000 sale. Our next Reddit post is from Just a View. Last year, my mom wanted to treat herself to a much deserved new car. She got approved through her credit union and headed to the BMW dealership in our city. After she and my dad test drove a few, they decided on one and they told the salesman they'd be paying with a check from their credit union. The salesman told them they only did in-house financing and they wouldn't accept the checks, so they had to apply through the dealer. I'm sure we can all assume why. After much back and forth and speaking with management, my parents were told that if they didn't want in-house financing, they could leave, so they did. They went to another dealership across town and decided on a completely different make. While they were at the second dealership, the salesman from the BMW dealership called them and asked them, are you ready to comply now? In a very arrogant manner. Once he heard that they were at a different dealership, he tried to tell them that that make of cars were terrible and they might be able to work with them on outside financing. My parents declined. They lost out on a $45,000 sale. Down in the comments, we have this story from Motor One. My recently widowed grandmother wanted a new car. She had decided on the model, but she asked me to go with her to the dealer because she didn't want the dealer to try to take advantage of a little old lady. Obviously, I go with her. We go to the first dealership where they had a car that she liked, but it wasn't much different than any of the compact cars on the dealer lot. We talk to the salesman a bit, she drives the car, all the normal stuff. We go inside to talk about trade, price, etc. I told the salesman that she was not interested in financing. He didn't want to hear it. He kept giving us monthly payment prices. He even pulled the old, let me talk to my manager bit. When he got back, I told him that we weren't interested in monthly payment numbers, just the price. I told him this car would not be financed. She just wanted to write a check and drive it home. Again, he said that he had to talk to his manager. By the time he returned, we were already gone. We went to a dealership down the road and she found a similar car that she liked just as much. The salesman came out and we talked a bit. She didn't even bother with a test drive since she had driven one not even an hour earlier. Okay, let's go in and fill out some paperwork. The salesman laid out a worksheet with sales price, trade value, taxes, etc. At the bottom of the sheet, there was a balance due figure. Before I could even ask if he could do a little better on the price, my grandma was writing the check. She drove that car straight back to the first dealer just to ask that salesman how he liked her new car. Our next Reddit post is from Motocon. A few years back, I was working abroad for my company on a project and I was away in California for two weeks, which turned into an unplanned five weeks due to various IT problems. This was 6,000 miles away from my lovely family and I was missing them. It was tough, but I was senior project lead in my company and there was nobody else with my skills to fill in. Also, a relevant detail, I had a milestone birthday present which was driving a supercar around to circuit for a day. This was a big birthday present from my wife and worth around 800 bucks at the time. This event needed to be booked way in advance and the voucher was valid for 52 weeks. Due to circumstances, I booked in week 50 of week 52. The problem was that because the latter part of the unplanned extra three weeks overlapped the driving event day, I told my manager that I couldn't rebook it because it was so late and it was non-cancelable. If my company wanted me to stay that weekend, they would need to compensate me for the lost event money. My direct manager was fine with this given how much I was sacrificing, but the VP of IT point blank refused, saying that it was unethical to refund a present to me and that I should just attend it. Okay then, Mr. Smartass VP, I will. The cost of flying back to the UK at short notice and returning the next day was £3,700, plus £300 in taxi fees to get me to and from home as per company policy. So they spent just under £400 in company expenses instead of just paying me £800. Our next Reddit post is from Lucia. This story starts with me and my company. I'm a 30-year-old businesswoman who works in an IT service in the banking space. I'm the girl for everything, basically, but I'm a specialist for first-level support, administration, and backup, sometimes even networking. Even though I have a ton of responsibilities, unfortunately, my pay grade doesn't reflect that at all. I think that my boss, who oversees the IT department, is kinda lazy, if not incompetent. He even brags about getting so much money for basically doing nothing. I have a 40 hour work week, but since the whole IT department is my responsibility, I need to keep track of the servers and maybe any problems that can occur 24-7. This is mostly done via email. 
when the server sends out a warning or a failure, I get notified by email, and then I fix the problem over remote desktop or go to the company itself, even in my free time. I wouldn't mind this, but I'm not getting paid for this. But on the other hand, I'm getting punished when something goes wrong. My boss's boss wasn't that much better. Since this is a fancy bank, everyone has to be in a suit the whole time to look professional. So I have to wear a business skirt and high heels. The only problem is, when you work in first level support, you need to do a lot of behind the scenes work, like slipping under the desk to do repair cable management, doing work on the server rack, and doing lots of other activities that makes you dirty. As you can imagine, this wore out my business clothes really, really fast. And not only that, they were so impractical and really made my work harder. So I changed my clothes to a comfy hoodie and work pants to fit the work that I'm doing a bit better. When my boss saw me, he was furious and said that I can't look like a poor hobo inside of his bank. I demanded that he let me have clothes for both occasions because professional suits are expensive and get worn out quickly. He refused, and I wasn't really happy about this. One day, my boss's boss, who's the head of the whole company, called me. He had this plan. He wanted to create quiet hours, which means that he didn't want his employees working on weekends so they could rest properly. And at first glance, you might think, hey, that's a nice idea. But no, he just didn't want to pay them for overwork because he got in some legal trouble for not paying overtime. So he said, please make sure that no one can access their emails or remote desktop over the weekend. No exceptions. Since we had a ticket system, I asked him to submit a formal ticket. Two reasons. First, I like everything documented. Second, I had to have something to protect and secure myself if the task that I was given was wrong, and this is exactly what saved me. But man, no exceptions? I was thinking to myself, should I write my boss and tell him the implications that would have? But after thinking about it, I remembered how I was treated as a worker, and I decided against it. I got to work immediately and made an automated process to block access to emails from Friday at 6pm to Monday at 6am. The weekend came, and I was calm and relaxed because finally I didn't have a bunch of work emails hitting me. Then, in the middle of the day, I was cooking myself and my husband a nice meal, and my telephone rings. It's my boss's boss. He talks to me in a stressed voice and tells me that he can't access his emails. I needed a second to process this, but I responded, that doesn't surprise me at all since you ordered me to cut everyone's email access without exceptions. He was angry, very angry, and told me that obviously that doesn't count for me. I told him that he specifically told me there are no exceptions, that he said everyone. He then argued that this wasn't how he phrased it, so I reread him his own email. After that, he was silent for a moment. He noticed the flaw in his logic. I broke the silence and asked him, Sir, if you still want access to your emails on the weekend, that's no problem. Please send me a request through the ticket system and I'll work on it first thing on Monday. A bit angry, he replied that he wants it done immediately and I calmly explained to him that I can't do this since my remote access is also blocked, like he ordered. He hung up on me. Ten minutes later, he calls me again. He calmly asked me if I could fix the problem right now and that he would pay me for overtime. He also wants me to be available at any time and this is going to raise my pay grade by a lot. I thought this was the perfect opportunity. I agree to his condition and pay raise, but only once me and my coworkers finally get casual clothing. He agreed. Since then, my work life has drastically improved, mostly only because I maliciously complied, well aware of the consequences of the given task. Our next Reddit post is from Naimien Aqua. It became apparent to me last week that my roommates were trying to drive me out of the house to get one of their boyfriends in on my lease. When I told them I wanted to stay, they started staging incidents and messes around the house so they could yell at me for them. And it all came to a head when they called a meeting with me two days ago. One of them had to hold the other back because she was screaming at me that she hated me and that I was not welcome in the building. They proceeded to tell me that I contributed nothing to the house and I wasted their space and that they had gotten close with the landlady and convinced her not to renew my lease in June. I told them I would talk to the landlady and when they said that they were the heads of the house, I laughed and went on with my day. I spoke to the landlady and she acknowledged that they were out of hand and while she did agree with them to not renew my lease, she also said that I could move out whenever and not pay for a single day that I wasn't there. 
So yesterday, when my roommates both left to visit family, I immediately called everyone I knew and vacated the house of everything I owned. I took the curtains, the rug, all the cat toys, and even the cat tower that I made with my mom. I took all of their things off of my shelves and other furniture and stacked them in the middle of the now nearly empty living room. I took pictures of everything, handed the keys to the landlady, and immediately effed off. They won't be back to the house until tomorrow. I've blocked them on everything, so I won't get any angry messages. But I'm sure their faces will be priceless when they come home to a half-empty house with hundreds of dollars in storage and furniture gone. So much for me not contributing anything to the house, now I actually don't. They also have to find someone else to take up the lease until the boyfriend can move in in June. Otherwise, they'll have to pick up my portion of the rent. Feels pretty good. Our next Reddit post is from the Gynchiatrist. This happened years ago. I'm an OBGYN in a busy suburb of San Francisco. One of my patients was the vice president of a large health insurance corporation. She was a dynamic executive who climbed the corporate ladder quickly. One of her special talents was reducing healthcare benefits for patients. She initiated a policy where women who underwent a C-section would have to be discharged in two days rather than the standard four-day hospital stay. Shortly after having in vitro fertilization, she found herself pregnant with twins. During one of her office visits, I mentioned the new two-day policy. I told her that, for some patients, it was really rough to be discharged after major surgery in two days and to be expected to care for a newborn infant. She just smiled and said that she didn't get where she was in corporate America by giving away money, and that patients just had to suck it up. That health insurance wasn't meant to be convenient. She was 42 years old and went full term with her twins. Despite her age, she elected to attempt an old-fashioned delivery because of the quick recovery. Her labor was long and extremely difficult, and ended with a C-section. On day two, I went to her room to complete her discharge from the hospital. She said, I am not leaving. This is inhuman. You can't expect me to go home and take care of twins like this. I can barely walk. All you need to do is write a note in the chart that says that I'm having a complication. My stay will be authorized. I told her that would be fraud, and I wouldn't be willing to falsify a medical record. Anyway, about a year later, the state of California forced them to reverse the policy. Yeah, so like, that's a funny story, but it's really depressing that after she experienced the, like, pitfalls of her own toxic policy, she still wouldn't change it herself. The government had to intervene and be like, Yo, listen, I know you guys are like a health insurance company, so you're kind of built on the misery of others, but you've gone way too far this time. We've got to step in and change this. You'd think that would be like a moment of clarity for her where she's like, oh, I see what I've been doing to other people. Instead, she's like, yeah, so I've had the worst couple of days of my life. I'm in agony and I can't take care of the kids. I think this is a fine policy. Let's keep it as it is. That was our slash malicious compliance. And if you like this content, check out my podcast where I publish the exact same episodes. Also hit that subscribe button because I put out new Reddit videos every single day.